Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you here today. My name is Rob Kaczynski, pastor of Trinity United Methodist Church. If you are joining us online, we welcome you into our sanctuary this morning. And if you are joining us over the airwaves or the radio, we're glad that you're able to join us here as we you know, talk about the Word of God together and as we learn from God's wisdom in, in our life. It is just so great to have you here today. Uh, we're continuing our sermon series called Summer Storytime, looking at the lessons from Jesus. And I haven't preached in three weeks, so um, I have three weeks of words stored up. So if you're hoping to get out a little early to celebrate this beautiful day, yeah, i got some bad news. Um, <laughs> No, we'll make it quick today. But uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about self-righteousness. Is anybody self-righteous here? Good. Well, for those of you who it is, this applies to you. For those of you who aren't sure, maybe it applies to you. For those of you who it doesn't apply, uh, who you feel it doesn't apply, it applies to your neighbor, who you think is self-righteous. So uh, just glad you're able to be here today to share that word together on this uh, important parable, I think, in, in, in our, from Jesus. Um, before we begin, just some really quick announcements. Our mission focus for this whole month is She's Somebody's Daughter. We heard quite a bit about that um, last week. The wonderful things they do to keep others out of uh, a trafficking situation in our local area. So I just ask that you give generously. We've supported them for a number of years, and uh, they really do wonderful work to get people out of um, dangerous conditions uh, so that they can experience full life. That is our mission for this coming Sunday. Our Lunch and Learn will be happening next week. I'll be presenting at that Lunch and Learn. For those of you who are unaware, Lunch and Learn is uh, something we do quarterly uh, where we bring up a topic that is relevant to our church life together or provide some information that you may find interesting, and we break bread together by a potluck. Uh, I'll be talking about what happened at General Conference this year, as best I could relay that, um, and what that kind of means for us here as a church. So if you're Want to come to that? Again, please bring a dish to pass, but sign up so we know how many refreshments to provide. You could do so by scanning the QR code, um, or you could just write on the, your connection card uh, that you would like to go to that, just so we have some awareness of numbers. Hope to see you there. We have a summer service opportunity. We're going to be providing bags for Mission Central, and I'm going to be reading from my script here so I don't omit anything. Um, it's going to be happening on August 9th, um, and we're going to be having, making some packing kits that will go to areas that are in need. We're going to be meeting in Fellowship Hall. You can look at your worship folder for some detailed information. Well, this is right there, 9 to 11. Um, and we have 120 bags in which we're hoping to fill. So we need items to fill these bags that will go to Mission Central, which will reach out to those who are in need. If you need a list of items, uh, we have those at the um, information table out in our lobby area. So I encourage you to get a list if, if you would like to help support this. And also you could come yourself and, and just attend and, and help fill these bags, because it really makes it a lot easier if we have more hands to do this. Again, that's on Friday, August 9th, from 9 to 11. Hope to see you there and continue to support our local community in this way. It is so good to have you worshiping with us this morning. Let us all stand for our opening chorus, Spirit of the Living God. Kathy Weber and I'll be serving as your liturgist today. If I look like I'm squinting, my one contact lens is not behaving nicely today. So bear with me. 
Um, please join me as we are called to worship. Praise God of our days for grace that sustains us. We wait for God's word to strengthen us. Praise God of our years for mercy and forgiveness. Grant us eyes to see where we fall short and instead let us graze on what is eternal. Praise God of infinity for the peace that passes understanding. May we revel in God's word and become visible witnesses to God's invisible kingdom. Please join me in our opening hymn, number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. join me now in our congregational prayer, which will be followed by your silent time for your request to take before the Lord, and then we'll join together in the prayer our Father taught us. Merciful God, apart from your spirit, we confess that all too often we are prone to run amok. How easily we have forgotten you, O God of our salvation. Like the Pharisee in today's scripture, we wander onto paths of self-righteousness and self-congratulations. We commit the deadly sin of pride, comparing ourselves to others we deem less worthy. We ask for forgiveness for thinking we know best and that we can manage nicely on our own. Deliver us from pretense and false pride. We know that humbly walking with you is the antidote to our pride. Fill us with your grace, mercy, and peace that we might be a testimony to those qualities to others. Make us penitent like the tax collector. We give thanks that you forgive our past are at work in our present and have promised an eternal future with you. And now the prayer our Father taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please take a moment to share your peace and love with those around you. Thank you, Jim and Faith, for sharing your God-given talents and blessings of your music. Thank you so much. Um, our scripture this morning is from Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified, rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join now in singing our hymn 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian.
us all bow our heads together. O oh, everlasting and righteous God, we give thanks that we could come here today to learn from you and from your word. Once again, we just ask, Lord God, that you humble our hearts to hear it, that we may apply it to who we are in our Christian faith and our discipleship. So take our hearts and mold them to be more like you, and so we may be a faithful witness to you in our world. Open our ears and our eyes and then our mouths to be your representatives in this world. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. So last week, uh, <laughs> we got back from our uh, little vacation that we took, 10-day vacation, uh, we, and it, frankly, it was kind of something like a, a whirlwind kind of vacation. Most of you don't know what we did, uh, but we, we just kind of traveled the whole entire East Coast. That was our vacation this year. Um, happy to be home, have to say. It's always nice to be on vacation, to be away, uh, but it's also nice coming home sometimes where you could experience some regularity, some normalcy, get back into the whole swing of things, the whole routine of things. It's nice to be away, also nice to come home after being away for some time. It's a lot cheaper being home. <laughs> now, uh, this year we actually began our trip in Boston. We, we picked up our boys who are finishing up their mission trip with our youth group. Uh, and they went to Boston this year for their, their, their mission trip. Uh, apparently, they wanted to go on vacation, too, with us this year. And so we picked them up in Boston. And because we were in Boston, we went to Fenway Park together, uh, of course. Um, and the next morning, early the next morning, we had to hop a flight from Boston to fly all the way to Tampa, Florida, where at 4 p.m. that next day, we had another baseball game uh, that we had to catch because that was pretty much our whole entire vacation this year, going to different baseball parks. It was my wife's dream. <laughs> She's kind of a saint, I have to say. Anyhow, while we were uh, flying, or actually, as we were jumping our flight from Boston to Tampa, I was assigned a seat that was not near where my wife and two kids were. They were all sitting next to each other. I was assigned a seat that was away from them. I don't know why this happened. I don't think that they requested that I sit away from them, um, as far as I know. But I think it was because the way that the plane was laid out, the way the seats were kind of, uh, you know... Um, designed, uh, that I was placed in a row behind them and, and, and off to the other side. Um, and so I wound up sitting next to this lady who, of course, I didn't know before. Now, now call me crazy, but whenever I, I go on an airplane and I'm within four inches of somebody who is in kind of my personal space, uh, I can't help myself but I kind of got to talk to these people. I don't care if they want to talk to me or not. I'm going to talk to them. I don't, uh, I don't care if they want to watch a movie or they want to read their book or they want some privacy. I'm just going to talk with them because I get nervous on planes. I, I don't like going on planes sometimes. I get a little bit nervous. And so how I handle that most is by talking to them. That's how I handle my anxiety sometimes. Uh, I also want to know that this person who is kind of sharing my turf, um, isn't, well, a lunatic. Um, <laughs> I want to be sure they're not going to do something crazy like order the cod, fish, and Stilton special that's on the airplane while I'm sitting in no shot of them. I want to be sure that this person is going to have my back if this whole, you know, flying tube experience is going to go south, right? I don't care if they want to talk or not, I'm going to talk to them. So cue up this victim next to me, this old lady. And I started off by making small talk, talking about what we're doing as a family, that we're going from this ballpark to this ballpark, going from here to there with our travels. Uh, and then she told me a little bit about where she's going, how she has a wedding that she was attending in Florida, that she used to work for Georgetown University, that, she, that her husband uh, used to work for the former telecom MCI, that she has a daughter that she's meeting in Florida that's 36 years old, never 
hasn't been married and she's hoping that this wedding is going to spur something within her daughter that, that she's going to want to get married. Oh, I got the whole detail about this whole thing. But then she got asking what I did for, for a living and I told her I'm a Methodist pastor uh, close to Hershey, Pennsylvania. And immediately upon me saying that, her countenance dropped. Oh, she said. And it was like some magic switch happened. I don't know, like a cone of silence just dropped around her, right? Right? It got really weird. It got really weird once I said that. In particular, when she then, immediately after I said that, she picked up the book that was in her, in her like, travel bag. She picked it up and she started reading. <laughs> now, I don't think she worked for Nestle, and that was the problem. I think this whole conversation ceased at that minute because she found out that I was a representative of the Christian faith. That's what I think. And so me, like being a little weirded out by this whole thing and knowing you have to spend the next three hours sitting next to this lady, um, she, she, she kind of broke the silence because she saw I was kind of like, oh, this is weird. And she said, well, you got to know it's not that I don't like pastors. I don't even know you. She said, I just don't like religious people all that much. Ah. Now we're on to something. And even though, admittedly, I'll, I'll admit this, I felt a little bit defensive after hearing that, like saying something like, oh, you're lumping me in with all those people that maybe you had a bad experience with, and not only me, but all of you guys who I know are pretty good, um, like you're lumping us all together. I, I, I didn't get defensive. I just said, oh, well, that's all right. What don't you like? And she admitted, you know, I just had some bad experience with some really religious people. Every time I'm, I'm just surrounded by them, you know, I just feel like uh, I'm just being judged, like I'm being evaluated, and I just never could measure up. And, you know, it just drives me a little bit crazy when I hear religious people say things inside of church on Sunday morning, but they live their life completely differently as soon as they leave the church. And then she concluded by just saying, you know what, I don't deal well with self righteousness self-righteousness and I wasn't planning on preaching on this before I went on vacation but boy there's a part of me that feels like I just gotta preach on this because even though I didn't say so at the time I kind of got where she was coming from because sometimes I don't like religious people either I like faithful people Love faithful people. But religious, sometimes, mm, because it's different. You can be religious and not be very faithful. And again, while there was part of me that wanted to be, to be really defensive on this lady on that day, like saying, no, 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 you got us all wrong. You got us all wrong. There was another part of me that, that thought, you know what? Maybe I should kind of listen to her a little bit more because I am pretty much convinced that if Jesus was in the middle seat between us both, he would have nudged me and said, you know what, Rob? Maybe you got to pay attention to what she's talking about here. Maybe you got to listen to her. So I felt it important for me to talk about this on this Sunday on my first opportunity to preach back because more or less, this is what this parable is kind of about today. It just happened to be that way. Self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. It's this wedge. It is this force that, if we are not careful, becomes a stumbling block between you and another person and even between you and God. Now, if you do even a cursory, very quick reading of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to discover that Jesus was constantly in conflict with the religiously self-righteous of his day. He was constantly butting heads with those people who were religiously self-righteous, who almost specialized in judging others for not measuring up. 
not following the rules exactly as they felt the rules should be followed as outlined in the scriptures. They really seemed to tick Jesus off. I find it so interesting that Jesus never got mad at the adulterer. He never got mad at the prostitute. He never got mad at the tax collector. No, no, no. He always seemed to have a beef with those who were religiously self-righteous. Why? Why? Never the sinner, it seems. But the self-righteous, hmm. Now, when I say that word self-righteous, you may immediately feel that I'm not talking about you. Like, oh, I'm not self-righteous. That's not me at all. But the truth is, come on, all of us in some way deal with a little bit of self-righteousness. Just a little bit, right? Just a little bit. A little bit. And if you want to gauge yourself as if you're a little bit self-righteous, a little bit self-centered, next time you take a group picture and you're in it, Tell me this, who do you look at first? Who do you look at first, right? If you're looking at a group picture and you're in that picture, the first person you're going to look at, and don't tell me you don't do it, you look at you to see how you look, right? I do this too. And you know that if you look good and everybody else looks crummy, you're going to say what? That's a great picture. Right? That's a nice picture right there. We got to frame that baby, right? Right? And the reverse is true, too. If you look at it and your teeth are, like, yellow and you're, like, feeling a little bit frumpy in that picture, and everybody else looks great. They look like models, and, you know, they can have the Grand Canyon as a backdrop behind them, and you're going to say, oh, that's a terrible picture. That's lousy, right? You're going to make an assessment on this whole group based on where you are in the picture, right? Now, what I know about religion is this. We kind of do the same thing. We're so fired up about our faith, and that's a good thing. We want to be fired up about our faith. We as believers, we know Jesus, we love Christ, we know what he could do for us, we know about this whole idea that we are forgiven for our sins, that our past is not held against us, that we can have this new life in Jesus, that God wants to be in a relationship with us, that we have this whole thing called grace, right? And we are on fire for God and what God has done for us. And boy, we love that, and that's a good thing. But if we are not careful, that needle could quickly tip just a little bit and we begin separating the world into those that don't know what we know and don't believe like we believe and those who do. And we quickly separate the godly as we define godly from the ungodly. Or the real believers who know what I know and experience what I experience from the fake kind of believers. And friends, that's dangerous territory. Self-righteousness takes credit for things that rightly belong to God. I feel so good about my relationship with God. Why? Why? Because of what I know. Because of what I have done. Now, we, we may not say this overtly, but it sometimes happens. Self-righteousness says, I could only go up if somebody else is below me, if somebody else goes down. I can build myself up only at the expense of somebody else being placed on a lower peg as I perceive it. And we all want to rise up, right? We all want to be exalted. Self-righteousness convinces us that there's this great measuring stick by which we are all evaluated. And so in order for me to raise up, some people have to be put down, put below us. And I'm telling you, Human beings are at our worst when we are persuaded by our superior virtues, especially when it comes to faith. Because then we start judging. The righteous from the unrighteous. The right way versus the wrong way. The 
truly godly and holy way versus the apostate. We start crusades, sometimes literally, because of this. And you know, at least when I read Scripture, it seems to me that Scripture kind of has a problem with this too. The single best way to drive a wedge between you and God and you and your neighbor is, is by being infected with this thing called self-righteousness. All throughout the Old Testament, you, you, you hear about it. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. Think about a person who had a fall from grace in their life. I, I guarantee you, I promise you, right before they fell, they were suffering from self-righteousness. Solomon pushes it even further. 16, verse 5, the Lord detests. And the Hebrew word for detests is the same word as hate. We don't even like saying the word hate, do we? The Lord hates all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. Oh, well, there's the Old Testament for you, all right? We're not going to go unpunished. But the Lord hates all the proud of heart. He hates those whose needle have tipped and they've become self-righteous. So finally, we got the New Testament. And knowing how pervasive this whole idea about self-righteousness is addressed inside of the Old Testament, Jesus, who is now completely at odds with the religious leaders of his day and his community, has had enough of them. He's like, I'm done with these guys. He's had enough of this group, and so he's going to give them a piece of his mind. And so in Luke 18, we hear Jesus tell this parable, this story. Why? Because Jesus really wants them to understand. He wants to be sure that they're going to get it. So, so he told this parable about some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Pay attention to this. Who did he tell it to? Those who trusted themselves. Listen to this. Trusted themselves. Not God. They didn't trust God. They trusted themselves for their righteousness and thus regarded others with contempt. They looked down on others that they felt weren't making the grade, weren't measuring up. So here's the parable. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. Okay, you know all about the Pharisee and the tax collector, Pharisees. They were considered like the uber-religious of their day. They were like the most religious people around. 2,000 years Later, we don't necessarily think of Pharisees as being super religious. They kind of have a negative connotation, like Pharisees were these mean, hypocritical kind of people, right? But let's be clear about something. 2,000 years ago, those Pharisees, they didn't know they were hypocritical, mean, religious leaders. They were earnest in their desire to know who God was. They wanted to try, they tried really hard to comply with the rules of the Old Testament. They were just trying to be faithful through their religion. They tried so hard. They didn't wake up every single day and said, well, how could I be a mean person today? No, that's not how they acted. What they did was try every single day to try to be as faithful to God as they could be. And so there's that Pharisee. And he goes up to pray alongside the tax collector. And you already know about the tax collector. Back in ancient Palestine, the tax collector was a special breed of sinner, right? Like you got the robbers, you got the adulterers, and then you got the tax collector. Like they are the bad ones, like they're the worst. They, they stole money from people just to line their own pockets. They betrayed their own society. Nobody liked the tax collector. 
So both of them on this day go to pray. Now this is how the prayer ends up. The Pharisee says, prays to himself and says thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. And then he gives a laundry list of people that he is not like, like these terrible sinners. He says, I'm glad I'm not like the robbers. I am glad I'm not like these evildoers, these adulterers, or even the worst of the worst, this tax collector. Even the tax collector. I am so glad I am not like them. Every category of people that were not in line with the law. And that's a problem. When we look at another person, we say, at least I'm not like that person. I'm so glad I am different. I'm so glad I am <clears throat> better. And it's right there where the seeds of self-righteousness, this measuring stick, is born. It's a problem. You know, in life, I think the, the problem of self-righteousness manifests in so many ways in our lives. But there are, there are two primary ways that, at least to me, stand out more than the others. Two that overshadow all the other forms of self-righteousness. The first category is probably the most obvious. It's the one that more or less says, I'm better than you. I'm better than you. I know the right way. The orthodox way, the, the proper way, the way I do it is way better than you do it. I'm right, you're wrong. That is the I'm better than you kind of self-righteousness. The way we do it in my church is so much better than the way that you do it in, inside of your church, your, your crew over there. I don't even need to listen to you because I've already got this whole thing figured out. And we assess people. Sometimes we do it unconsciously, but we, we assess people because we sometimes feel that our way is so much better than their way. And we do this in so many areas of our life. Especially if we are aligned with a group. Especially when it comes to our faith. You know, I was on our drive from the Tampa airport to the place we were staying all week that we drove by a number of churches. And there was this one church that stuck out in particular because, you know, we were at a stop sign and just stuck out to me. Uh, it was a large church. It had this trendy name like Solid Rock Church. Um, and, and on its signboard, it had illuminated what seemed to be their message that was going to be preached that Sunday, and it really piqued my interest. On the signboard, it said, our church really, underscore really, believes the Bible. Hmm. That was the sermon title for that Sunday. We really believe the Bible, which was a rather backhanded way of saying that all the other churches around there clearly don't, right? Right? It was a statement about where they stood. Across the street was another church uh, from that Solid Rock church um, with a more traditional name, the other church, and they just had on their side, board, all are welcome here. It was kind of a statement of where they believed Jesus was and what they believed the Christian faith should be. And because, you know, I'm weird, I can't help myself in these things, I immediately went online as soon as we got to the place that we were staying, and I go online, and I quickly Google, you know, this, this solid rock church, and I had to hear this message for this Sunday. And, um, and sure enough, it was on there, and, and the pastor delivered a 50-minute sermon 50 minutes, don't complain, don't complain if I go a little long today, 50 minutes sermon saying about how the way they believe is just so much better than the way everybody else believes, that, that their church is just frankly so much better than what they believe, especially that church across the street, right, who, who had it all wrong. 
His church was the understood, that understood the, the real eternal truths of the Bible. And he proudly declared that he's not even part of the local ministerium. Why? Because they have it all wrong. They're just faking it. They had it all right in his church. And all I know is that if you wake up every single day looking at things or people to criticize others around, around you, your neighbor, your spouse, your kids, your co-workers, your pastor, your teacher, even the politician, if you wake up every single day and just constantly criticize everybody and everything around you, you've probably been a little bit infected by this whole self-righteous force. And pastors are not exempt. Sometimes churches are the places where it flourishes the most. You know, our Puritan forebears fled to England because of religious persecution, and they weren't here for more than two days they set up shop in two days, and immediately they became intolerant of everybody else who doesn't think and act exactly like they did. And it just kind of carries. Baptists don't like Presbyterians, who don't like Lutherans, who don't like Methodists, who don't like fundamentalists, who don't like, well, anyone, Right? And we argue, and we throw barbs at one another, like, you baptize babies at your church? Oh, we believe in believer's baptism. Wait, you serve everybody communion at your church? <laughs> we only serve people who believe who are members of the church. And we love to think that our way of doing it is so much better than theirs. That our doctrine is the right one. Our dogma is the right one. Our system is the right one. Our reading of the Bible is the right way. We can't even get along with ourselves sometimes as people of faith because of our self-righteousness. This amazes me. Throughout my career as a pastor, I've been part of three ministeriums. Two broke up after a year. Why? Self-righteousness. Everybody thought they had it right. Couldn't get along. This is exactly, I think, what Jesus is talking about. I'm so glad I am not like them. Because they're a bunch of knuckleheads. And they don't get it the way we get it. See, it's no wonder sometimes that somebody on a plane says, I really don't want to be around you because you guys can't even get along with yourselves. I think Jesus suggests that nothing is going to cause a bigger wedge between you and God than pride. Self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is the precursor to the fall. So people of faith, maybe we've got to listen to a woman on a plane. And, and there's another level of self-righteousness very quickly. Uh, maybe you say, oh, Pastor Rob, I'm not self-righteous. I'm as humble as they come. I don't have a self-righteous gene in my body. And I get that. Maybe you really feel that way. But you know what? There's a second level of self-righteousness that we got to be a little bit careful to. It's one that I fall into a lot. It's one that hits me square in the face. It's the one that says, I can handle it all by myself. Thank you very much. I got it. I'm good. I don't need your help. I don't need your input. I'm telling you, if you have a problem asking anybody for help in your life, you've got to look this category pretty hard. Or people want to give you a helping hand, and you have a hard time acknowledging or listening to their ideas. You, you may be infected by this, I could handle it all by myself, thank you very much, kind of self-righteousness. Do you know how I know? Do you know how I know when this kind of self-righteousness is present in my life? It's when my prayer life becomes on again, off again. If your prayer life is on again, off again, you may be dealing with, I could figure this all out myself kind of self-righteousness. 
You may, you may not be thinking maliciously towards God, but, but if you have this on-again, off-again kind of prayer life, what you're essentially behaviorally telling God is that, God, I don't need your input. I don't need your assistance. I don't need to listen to what you have to say right now. I'm good. I got this whole thing by myself. And if that creeps in, it's not like you're malicious in what you're doing, but you're kind of suggesting, God, I can handle this on my own. Thank you very much. God wants to give you grace. God wants to give you, God wants to give you this wisdom. God give you direction. God is saying, I want to give you all these things, but, but you just need to ask. And you say, nah, I'm good. I got it. And this plays out so many times in real life. You may be in dire straits, but you'll never ask for help, right? Or maybe you're stuck in a big debt problem, and somebody suggests that you go to debt counseling, and you're like, oh, no, no, I've seen people that have done that. That's not me. You know what that is? That is the, I am so much better. I'm not like those people over there. I'm so glad. Some people are addicted to things. They would never dream of going to an AA or an NA meeting. Why? Why? <laughs> I've seen it. Somebody else try that. Didn't work for them. Can't possibly work for me. So the antidote to all this self-righteousness is humility. Because if we're not careful... This I'm better than you self-righteousness can creep into our life so easily. If we're not careful, this I can handle it all by myself kind of self-righteousness could creep in and nothing is going to drive a bigger wedge between you and God and you and your neighbor more than this kind of self-righteousness. And the good news is, the good news is, this is what God wants us to do. God doesn't want to beat you down. This isn't about keeping you down. This isn't about making you go home after the sermon today and say, oh man, I'm so self-righteous. I don't know what I'm going to do. No, no. Let me tell you how this plays out. Verse 13. But the tax collector, you know, that really bad sinner, separate from everybody else, um, he wouldn't even look to heaven. But he was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And look what happens. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. This guy, the sinner that humbled himself, he went to his home justified rather than the uber-religious guy. Why? Because all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Lift it up. Lift it up. That's what God wants to do, to lift you up, not keep you down. With our self-righteousness that we harbor in our hearts, to some degree, we keep ourselves down. Jesus says, I'm trying to lift you up. I want you to go to heights that you never thought were possible in your life. I want you to achieve things that you never dreamed would be possible. I'm trying to get you from here to here. And the only way to do that is if you remove that wedge of self-righteousness that is hindering our relationship. The only way to do that is to humble yourselves. What that means is if you are infected thinking you're better, you're self-righteous, it means you got to humble yourself. It means you got to start serving others, loving others. If you're infected by this, I could do this by myself, thank you very much, kind of self-righteousness, you've got to humble yourself by calling somebody and asking for help when you need help, talking to God and saying, God, I need your help down here. God, help me follow your way for me in my life and not me trying to direct my own life. This is about the decisions that God wants you to make in your life. Every character in the Bible. None of them were exalted before they were humbled. Noah. Humbled before God. 
Nehemiah, humbled before God. David, humbled before God. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Paul, all of them were humbled by God. And after they were humbled, they were exalted ten times the people that they were before. And this is the beauty. If you allow yourselves to be humbled in this way, not only are you going to pull out that wedge that is kind of preventing you from really experiencing um, God, but it's also going to take away that wedge between you and that person sitting next to you on a plane who wants to run away the minute you say, yeah, I'm a faithful Christian. And they're going to want to know more about you and who you are. In the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now collect your tithes and offerings as a symbol of our commitment to our God. and gracious God, we give thanks for all the blessings that you have given to us, and we give thanks that we are able to return some of these gifts to expand your kingdom so that others will know about you and find wholeness in their life. Bless these gifts. Help us to use them wisely as your church, that all may come to know of your gospel message through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.
People of God, humble yourself before God that you may be lifted up and know the glory of our Savior and the love of Jesus Christ our Lord. And may God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless you in all you do. Amen.